Welcome to Meet the Archive Online. My name is Frank Roemen and I'm Director of Collections at I Film Museum. This year's edition of Meet the Archive will be different for two reasons. First of all, due to the pandemic, we will not present and perform on site. Instead, we will present a eight part series online. Second, the curators will not look back to all the restorations, preservations, presentations and all the research we did last year. Instead, we will celebrate our 75th birthday. I Film Museum exists this year 75 years. And the I curators will zoom in to the history of 75 years. So I wish you a lot of fun with our online Meet the Archive. This is part three. In this panel we are going to talk about the reuse of archive material. Since the establishment of the I Film Museum 75 years ago, the rich archive collection has been reused. Images that may or may not be copyright protected are available to those who want to tell a story. Can this material be reused just like that? Are there rules, conventions, ethical standards and what about fiction or propaganda? Can the original meaning of the image be ignored? Semua cerita tentang perjuangan abadi mereka. Belanda diduduki, teriak tuanku. Indonesia dijajah selama 300 tahun, kata Marlan, tukang kebun kami. Juga ada aturan lain. Sekarang orang Belanda di tanah airnya sendiri nggak berkuasa lagi. Di sekitar aku, orang-orang bertanya-tanya kenapa justru Belanda masih berkuasa di sini. Seperti koper dibuka, isinya kesedihan dan pikiran yang tersembunyi.
Beberapa waktu lagi tampaknya keresahan hilang Sama saja seperti semula We start with one or more questions about our most recent co-production, the largest in ice history. They call me Babu. My first question is for Sandra Behrens, director of this film. In your film, you tell a universal story about female inequality and you give voice to the life stories of many nannies in the former colony of the Dutch East Indies, translated into the story in which one woman is central. A story that you color with archive images that give you a new meaning, a meaning that wasn't there before. In addition to newsreel and documentary images, you also used staged and fiction images and this materials not always used chronologically. To give Babu Alima a voice, shape and a world of its own, you mainly use home movies. Sandra, you have done Lengthy research, you understand very well how you can use archive material to tell your story. How has it brought you all that viewing of material? Has it helped you in the realization of your film plan? Or was the film already in your head? And while watching and being moved by the images, something else happened? Please tell us. Thank you for your nice introduction, Dorette. Um, well, you know, it started just with a question and just with a curiosity. I wanted to know something about the former nannies called Babus in uh, the former Dutch colony, um, Dutch Indonesia. Um, and so I was interested in everything. So I was kind of like a sponge and everything around it. Um, and could be films, could also be stories of all kind of people who are attached to nannies, to Babus. Um, I wanted to know everything, so um, I started with you um, here in the not in I as it is now, but in in the basement or in the cellars, and we found wonderful material. Um, but um, the thing was that because I didn't know, um, I didn't have the story in my in my head before. It was just a question, and I was very curious. So it means that I was very open to everything that I saw and heard. So sometimes I saw images that were so beautiful and I didn't know where it has to fit in my story, uh, but I was definitely sure it has to, it belongs to my film. So um, to give an example, I saw these wonderful shots of uh, women working in the kapok industry and kapok is, um, it's a seed and it was used in the former Dutch Indonesia to make uh, matrasses and pillows. And, you know, it was just like some kind of poetic image. And I just thought, okay, I don't know where, but I need it. And then later on, uh, the funny thing was then when we first met, um, I was look because I looked for uh, Babus, but it was not a topic in, in the catalogue. So I, I looked like kind of, well, hundreds of home movies and I knew that when there was a child involved in, and they were living there, there must be a babu. But so I looked for a lot of, uh, uh, and a lot of films and then there were a lot of uh, babies and children, you know, with blushing and, and they're, they're very well fed and white and luxury. And sometimes there was a babu, but sometimes they were not filmed. And I only saw in, in, in the end that, that there was a tree moving. I thought there, there must be someone. But then when we were together, um, I, there was something written like I was with babu at the beach and we were looking and looking at all these old uh, film rolls and we didn't see anything. Okay, well, yeah, shit happens. And on, totally on the end, we did it on this, in this old machine and you were... And then suddenly she was there in the garden with snow for the first time. And I thought, okay, now I can, I don't know how, but I will use this kapok to the snow and some, in a way it will fit.
Er was er eens een echtpaar. Hij de zoon van een Rotterdamse scheepsmagnaat, zij een prinses van Georgische adel. Ze leerden elkaar kennen in 1924, toen Moskou een bruisende stad was. Een stad die bevlogen communisten uit de hele wereld aantrok. Een stad met een belofte. Het zou het arbeidersparadijs op aarde worden. Ну что ж, вот здесь похоронены мои родители. Сиверт, Лан, Рейсма, Вильям и по-русски не Франц, Францевич. Аргутинская, Аргутинская, Долгорукая, Нина Александровна. Мама, вот княжна Аргутинская, Долгорукая. Кстати, мы очень скрывали, что мы князья. И то, что Аргутинский, было разрешено писать и говорить. А вот что он долгорукий князь, об этом предпочитали и не заикаться даже. Это действительно было некоторым барьером. Дворян не брали высшее учебное заведение. Был такой, я бы сказал, классовый минимум. А о том, что отец происходит из богатого буржуазного рода, Ни в каких анкетах он это не подчеркивал. Он говорил, что мама его скромная учительница немецкого языка, а отец служит, служащий пароходной компании, который только в последний год там был назначен на пост управляющего. Вильям Рейсема и Нина Аргунтинская. Так шел этот экспорт в жизнь в классовой Советской hun enige zoon Jan werd geboren in 1934, in een land dat steeds meer naar buiten trad als een heldhaftige heilstaat. My second question is about the fragment of the TV program Andere Tijden, Other Times, which we saw in the editing and which were provided by director Gerda Janssen Hendricks. Gerda, because of your work as director for the Dutch broadcaster, you are reusing archival footage on a daily basis. On your blog, Who Owns the History? You will discuss the problems associated with the reuse of propaganda and fiction images, among other things. In it, you take a discussion as an example about a Portuguese film from 2005. For a critical film, the maker used propaganda material that glorifies fascism by using various visual means such as deceleration in combination with abstract music. She knows how to use these images for her own story. You say about this, because when your images slow down, you see more. And when you edit, you often see a shot passing by many times and you notice things you didn't see before. Now my question, which visual resources are appropriate for use in more journalistic historical programs? What visual resources material do you use to achieve your goals? How do you apply this in your work? And what are the pitfalls or problems? Now let me start. When you make a program like Andere Tijden, which is a weekly historical magazine, 
um, and you do it about events, and you, when you start researching for uh, footage, the first thing you do is try, of course, to find the most obvious uh, newsreels, reports, whatever. But, of course, that is not always the case. Sometimes you're very lucky. I mean, I once made a broadcast about the last Dutch scientific expedition to uh, New Guinea, Dutch New Guinea. This was in the, at the end of the 50s. And now because it was scientific, they had their own film camera with them. Some of the people, scientists, had their own 8 millimeter films. There was a television report. This was this huge amount of, of, of footage that I had, which was really beautiful. But this is really an, uh, very seldom. <laughs> you also have um, stories that you do want to tell, but there's no footage at all. And then I will be uh, searching more like Sandra does. I mean, you're looking for context. I mean, things that, that have to do with the subject or the story you're telling, but which uh, the footage is not exactly about that. And that can be preferably um, more abstract things. Like you were also the example of, you know, rain, volcano eruption, those kind of things. But what you also do, at least for our program, is that you can film those kind of things. I mean, raining or landscapes, you can film them yourself. You, you, you're not uh, dependent only on archive footage. And uh, that is what you can also see in the uh, fragment that, I, uh, that will be used about uh, Moscow. Because... What I wanted to do with that story, which is about a Dutch uh, man who uh, marries a Russian who becomes pretty important in the Communist um, International Party, in uh, an organization, I should say, in the 30s in Moscow. Well, you know, that for him, this is, uh, he's, he's an doing it because he believes in communism and he believes in the atmosphere. And so, the whole thing starts with the wedding, or at the wedding. There's a wedding party there, which I filmed at the moment when we were in Moscow. At that moment, and it conveys the whole atmosphere. And then you can go to, to uh, I go to the archive footage, which is from a Tsigo uh, Vertov uh, film, Three Songs from Lenin, which is also this kind of exuberant Moscow. You know, with, 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 with everything is alive there. It's is a city. And then I'll also mix that with shots we made ourselves in Moscow also, because actually when I made this, this was at the beginning of uh, was 2001 something, and there was an atmosphere also in that moment, it was not the autocratic Putin Russia, but it was a Russia which was also kind of optimistic about the future. Mm -hmm. So you could, and, and the archives were opening up, which is also, I mean, they're closed again now, but that's, you know, then they were opening up, which was very interesting. But um, you have this archive, and the, uh, together with what I'm filming at the, uh, at the moment, and it gives a kind of atmosphere. And then you get the contrapoint, because then you get the eyewitness, the, the man who is the, the son of the couple, and who's right away telling us uh, that his father, they had to hide their, their origins. I mean, his father is from a very wealthy uh, Dutch family. His mother was uh, a, a princess. And they never, he, he tells us, they never uh, spoke about that because you can do that in communist uh, Soviet Euro Russia where everybody was supposed to be equal and classless and everything. <laughs> and then this is, um, coming back to the journalistic kind of thing, what you, what, at least what I do, what most of us do is you juxtapose um, archive footage uh, with, with eyewitnesses. So you can, you know, the eyewitness convey sometimes another message, but then it's, it's uh, clear that the footage is also propaganda. You don't have to say, this is propaganda. I mean, no, you, you, I mean, the viewer will know that. My third question is uh, for Ronnie Temme, and we talk about it later on probably as well. Um, Ronnie Temme is former image researcher at iSales Collection. And um, from the previous uh, conversation about reuse of archive material, we learned that the different genres shouldn't be an obstacle to, to the use of visual material for specific teams. Um, Ron, you have supervised image research questions for many years. You were part of the creative process. You have usually seen a lot more than your 
customers. How do you deal with this with an open search query? How much direction do you give and why? And how do you help customers who are looking for images with regard to metaphorical concepts or things that cannot simply be seen in non-fiction images? What are the problems you encounter here? Please tell us. Um, well, if the client isn't, uh, doesn't have any knowledge about the collection, of course, it's my task to uh, suggest uh, images for the production and of course you want to have a creative meeting to see what you can do as a researcher uh, looking for metaphors. Um, I remember there was a production, I think it was André van Hout who made the film 2602, the Japanese um, counting for years and he was making this film of the survivors of Japanese camps in Indonesia. Now, these were people who were interviewed and yeah, you could show uh, footage of the camps if there was such a thing. You have to, yeah, think of metaphors, like uh, a woman was talking about uh, a dream she always had, about uh, the, the, the little food they had. So you, you, you try metaphors to, to, to show. Um, and, but he, his, his um, request was, it has to be poetic, yeah, so aesthetically beautiful to watch. So, opening up flowers, um, in, in the case of cruel, uh, cruel uh, memories, you, you, would, you would show an explosion or something like that. So, you sit down with the, with the maker to see what would fit the production. And that's a lovely um, a process. Music is difficult. You, if there's music, you have to uh, yeah, direct uh, the maker to, or refer the maker to the right holder. Uh, of course, if, if they're right, um, you could refer that person, but you can also do the communication to the right holder and then explain what it's for. Um, so the price could be um, go down a little bit, which is in favor of the maker. Um, all that sort of negotiations you're 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 going to do, and um, yeah. So you can be part of it if the maker knows exactly what he or she wants. Then and no problem. You 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 supply the footage and and you make up a contract and that's it. Yeah, maybe I want to ask something to Gerda, uh, because what is interesting is that I think there's a big difference in making uh, a film uh, for the cinema and making for television, um, especially because then you work in a kind of formatted way, you, let, you know, it's like 25 or 50 minutes or something like that, and it's every week, so there are deadlines. And I wonder if there was, because... Um, I wonder if there was, uh, uh, you, you made uh, an item in which you found uh, material, but later on, like a year later or whatever, you find much better uh, uh, archive material and you think, oh my God, I wish I had seen this before. And what are you doing with it? Well, actually, it still happens also. But the research that I do about film footage about the Dutch East Indies, and you always get new things, and then, you know, there will be new home movies coming. But even uh, from the official uh, sources, there can always... I'm now in discussion with a, a guy from the military museum because there seems to be... Uh, there's reports mm. that there have been uh, films... Made, uh, amateur film made from the last escape from the Dutch East Indies uh, fleeing the, the Japanese advancing troops. Mm -hmm.
And this is used by Cecil B. the Mill. That's how we came up to it. And then, yeah, and yeah, he saw the footage. I mean, there's evidence, reports about that. So this footage must be somewhere. Where is it? <laughs>